Uh huh. It's official. We got a power Good break. morning, everybody. Morning. Happy Super Bowl Sunday. Um, it, it's on the Christian calendar. It's part of the liturgy. Uh-huh. You didn't know about this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Super Bowl tie. Um, yes, everybody grab your coffee, your donuts. Um, because we might have a little bit lighter uh, crew today, let's try and sit together at tables so you're not talking by yourself or to the voices in your head. Um, so let's all try and sit together so we can have some good discussions. Um, today we have the great privilege again of Tyler Trailer teaching us today, which would be great. As a reminder, crickets. Yeah, crickets. <laughs> and there was much rejoicing. Yes. Yay! Yeah. Um, also, as a reminder, I would love it if you guys could send me your essay or thoughts or however you want to do it, a to-do li- or a bullet point list. Um, I, I have received one so far, so somebody's a, 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 a high achiever and sent it in early, which is what's, great. What's the absolute deadline so we can? <laughs> yeah, this guy. That's right. The absolute deadline is the last week of our uh, of our of our um, class here. So it's April, right? Yeah, which is April something or other. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, yeah. If you wait till Easter, it's too late. That's for sure. Um, yeah, you have to turn into your professor. That's right, Professor Carl. Yeah. Which essay are you going to turn into your professor? Oh, me? Oh, I have so many essays I have to turn into my professor. It's not even funny. That's why you want us to write some. Yes, so that I can give them to you. Although it's totally different topics, but that's okay. Which of our essays are you going to turn into your professor? Well, the best ones is what I'm going to do. Yeah, so I'm going to pick the best ones. This is all And then I'm a, this is all a ploy so that you guys can do my work for me. Yes, exactly. I'm burning time here so we can wait for everybody to sit down so we can get cracking here. <laughs> Do stand up here. I'm here all night, folks. <laughs> yeah. I take tips. Here's a tip. Don't do drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and pray, guys, and we'll get, get started here. Um, <coughs> Father God, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for the beautiful snow that reminds us that we are washed as white as that snow, God, with the blood of Jesus. Um, We're super grateful for that, for the redemptive power of Jesus. Um, God, we pray that today uh, we can learn a lot, have a great discussion uh, about these chapters, about morality and and so on, and that we can be uh, attentive, uh, receptive, and have some great discussions and really grow in our understanding of the, the nearness, the, the basics of Christianity, so that we can bring this out to a lost and hurting world. Um, God, we pray that uh, today if we have Super Bowl parties, that we can be great neighbors to our actual neighbors and allow that to be a great time of outreach, um, of helping them to see the light in our lives that you have given us so that we can spread the message to wherever we go. Um, God, be with us today. We love you. We need you. And we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. With no further ado, I give you Tyler Trailer. Well, so we're upgrading this week. We officially have some technology on our side. We're going to have visuals and text. So instead of just asking a question, you'll actually be able to read the question on the screen, which is great. <laughs> and, and as this continues, too, I'm sure that Chuck is going to put more and more work into these. And eventually it's going to be colorful. It's going to have transitions, the whole thing. So, this is pretty simple today, though. So, um, we'll go ahead and just dive in. So, Mere Christianity is split up into different books, right? And as you've been reading, you might have seen that we just finished book two, and we went into book three. And so, this third book is called On Christian Behavior. And so, when I was doing a little bit of research on this, essentially what Lewis had done was he actually had three separate books that all got compiled into mere Christianity. And this was the second one, written in 1943, right? So you can imagine the the worldwide context that's happening there. The war is happening, all of this. And so he writes this second book following kind of a case for Christianity. So he's just finished outlining the almost belief structure of Christianity, why we believe what we believe, right? And now he's getting into the practical of what do we do with that? next? What what is the moral basis for Christianity? 
right? So what does that look like? And he's really getting at the why do we act a certain way and how do we act that way, right? So Lewis is really going to deal with that, the why and the how. So I want to first just start off by showing a quote that I think really well summarizes what Lewis believes about morality. He says, moral rules are directions, so first they're directions, for running the human machine. Every moral rule is there to prevent a breakdown or a strain or a friction in the running of that machine. So, moral rules are not necessarily for, or, or what their first thing, I should say that, what their first thing is really to do is really to help promote the running of your life. They don't just exist so that we can, say, have a good economy, although those are good things, right? They don't just exist so that we can have good buildings, right? Moral rules actually exist for me, and they exist so that when I act, I actually can live well, right? My life can actually function like it ought to, okay? Lewis says this, though, and, and I think this is interesting because he's talking about moral rules, right? So it's easy to think of this as a rule list. Okay, so what, what are the rules? Then? How do I run this machine? But he says this, if we thought only of particular actions or of a list of do's and don'ts, we might be encouraging bad ideas. One, we might think that provided you did the right thing, it didn't matter how or why you did it. Right? So if we just have a list of rules, things to do, then it might not matter why I'm following the rules so much as I'm following the rules. Right? And second, if we just had a list of rules, we might think that God simply wanted obedience to that set of rules. Okay? So, again, moral rules exist so that we can actually run the machine well, but we don't just have a list of rules, because if we did, we might miss the why, and we ultimately might miss the obedience to God. It, it might actually change the way that we obey God, right? What Lewis says is that ultimately, God wants a specific type of person. He doesn't just want people that follow the rules, right? There is a list of rules, but he doesn't just want that. He really wants a type of person that engages with those rules. And yeah, what, what he ultimately says is, God wants virtuous people. And virtues are interesting because they're not just a list of rules. They're actually a, a way of being, right? They're, they're kind of the underlying structure of your life. So these are the four cardinal virtues that he lists. And, he, and there's a few others that he's going to talk about later, but these are almost like the secular virtues, the virtues that just make the machine run well on earth, right? And the four virtues, which really he gets from the Greeks, this, these are old virtues. Prudence, which is really just practical common sense, right? So being able to live as someone with common sense. It's not so much a rule, right? How, how, do, you, how do you tell on a rule list if someone is living with common sense? It's really kind of from the bottom up, right? So it's a virtue. Temperance, which is going the right length and no further. You can picture that in all sorts of things, food, television, your cell phone, whatever. Justice, which is fairness, honesty, and truthfulness, and then fortitude, which is courage. So, ultimately, Lewis says that in the Christian worldview, kind of at the base of mere Christian morality, is the virtuous type of person. Okay? It's the virtuous type of person. But that kind of cuts against the grain of what at least our culture thinks Christianity is. <laughs> Right? Because I think when most of us would interact with someone who's outside of this, they might say Christianity is a list of do's and don'ts. Right? Do this, don't do that. Practice this, don't practice that. Engage with these people, don't do that. Rather than getting to the heart of it, which is creating virtuous people. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to lecture for just a little bit. But then we're going we're gonna to start kind of diving in. So I'm going to do just a little bit more. Is that okay? Can I do that? Okay. The, the next thing here 
So we know that ultimately Lewis is trying to create a virtuous type of person. What Lewis would actually identify with is with someone or, or the, the philosophical world called virtue ethics. Okay, there's plenty of different ways of thinking about ethics. And, and what Lewis is ultimately going to say is that the virtue ethics is the best way to be doing ethics. And it's actually what Christianity promotes. Because it's not just a list of rules. We're ultimately trying to create virtuous people. Right? So real quick, what I want to do is go through and just explain a little of where virtue ethics comes from. Because Lewis doesn't just create this out of a vacuum, right? And he doesn't just find it in the Bible, right? Because if we read the Bible, it, it can be kind of hard to figure out, okay, is there a list of rules that I need to follow? Do I need to be a type of person, right? So Lewis doesn't just get this out of a vacuum. He actually is pulling from somewhere, right? So what we're first going to do is just look at where is he pulling from, and then we're going to try to compare and contrast this and, and think about this, okay? So where he really pulls virtue ethics from is actually from Aristotle. Aristotle says that the chief end of man is human flourishing, eudaimonia. Okay? This is Aristotle's view. And, and remember, Aristotle was, oh, before, well, he was, a, he was an early Greek philosopher, right? So you can imagine, essentially, he, him and Plato were essentially at the same time, right? And what his view is that the chief end of man is human flourishing, almost like running the human machine well. Remember that. Lewis says that moral rules exist so that we can run the, the human machine well and not have friction, not have hiccups, right? And this is ultimately similar to Aristotle. The chief end of man is human flourishing. This is interesting, though. Aristotle says that this, chief end of man, this is achieved by developing one's character through habits of virtue. Developing one's character through exercising, through working, right? Trying to build up your character. This is ultimately what Aristotle really gets at as, as kind of the core of this virtue ethic, okay? And Lewis actually somewhat agrees with it. And he says, that, he says this in, in the second chapter. He says, there is a difference between someone doing some particular action a uh, particular just or temperate action, and being a just and temperate man. Someone who is not a good tennis player may now and then make a good shot, right? So you may not be good at, at heart, but you can make a good shot. But what it means to be a good player is a man whose eyes and muscles and nerves have been so trained by making innumerable good shots that they can now be relied on. So he's agreeing with Aristotle. He's saying the chief end to some level of these morals is really for the flourishing of the human machine. Okay? And the way we do that is we train the muscles. We train the body, essentially, through habits of virtue. Okay. Now, I'm essentially going to throw the curveball in on this in a minute. But this is what Aristotle's virtue ethic says. Okay. It says to be virtuous is not just to do good, but to be good. Okay? To be virtuous is not just to do good, but to be good. And we become virtuous through training and discipline. So, here's where the first question comes in. Okay? Is this, as it's stated right here, as it's really laid out, is this a Christian view? Is this really mere Christianity? Right? Does that question make sense? Is this a Christian view? Y'all yeah. can discuss that in your groups for a little bit. Good question. I can. Yeah, right. It used to be in the meaning of virtuous behavior showing high general standards. Paradigms of virtue. Where do my good pens go? Traditional Christian methodology. That's the second highest order of the nine folks selection. Hierarchy. Hierarchy. 
Because you know, you're showing high moral standards, and now you have to set those sad high moral standards in some benchmark. Yeah. Uh, you, should, you should frame it as this. Is this. Yeah. I was going to say, like, yeah, this parentheses, parentheses, Aristotle. All right, so let's go ahead and round it back out. If someone's feeling brave, kind of give me a, a synopsis or a, or a summary of what your group talked about. If someone's feeling brave. Oh, check, yeah. Right, thank you. Anyone have a summary? We could wait all day. We're really good at waiting. Raise the question. Okay. The question was, is this a Christian view? Okay, is this a Christian view? Who, ha who has a bit of a summary on that? No. Okay. <laughs> That's a great summary. So the fundamental issue here is, is what it is that determines what good is. You know? um, so it's saying not just to do good, but to be good, but by new standards. So you don't have that. And 
I mean, what we also talked about was, well, you know, if you look at the Old Testament and all of the rules that were given there, literally everyone still felt short. So this idea of you being good is, you know, well, it, well as Lewis says, it's, it's an ideal, right, for us to aspire to, but it is never an attainable thing on our own. So. <laughs> oh boy, very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, when I looked at that, I thought, yeah, it's a Christian view minus Christ. It's important. Thanks for sharing that. One of the things, I, if you read much of uh, C.S. Lewis, is he looked at the old philosophers a great deal. He honored, honored all those who. Uh, had sharp minds, whether it's Aristotle or, or Plato or Socrates, or uh, and, and also the, uh, the the thought of the, the Christians you know, that, that began and uh, the medieval uh, thinkers and so forth, which in in some respects, though they we couldn't say they were Christians necessarily. But many of the virtues, and this is part, I think, of a, a Christian vi uh, virtue, in that what you do is you are forming good habits mm -hmm. by not just uh, doing good, but by, by being good, then you form habits and character so that uh, that's part of being a, a good Christian, is having a good character yeah. with Christian attitudes. Mm -hmm. I think I, I can round it out. Uh, I'll, ultimately, I'll, I'll give you all a hint. This is not actually fully Lewis's view, right? This is a part of it. Okay. So you're exactly right to say that this is mere Christian morals. Well, it's Christian morals without Christ, right? And in the previous chapter, we, we read the case for Christianity, where it essentially lays out the need that humanity has for a savior, because we don't follow these rules, right? So, ultimately though, I do think we all could agree that that first line is correct. To be virtuous is not just to do good, but to be good, right? The question then is how do you get there? So, I'm going to compare and contrast this real quick. Let's see. So, there's two different lines from Martin Luther that I just want to read. Okay. First one, there's no moral virtue without either pride or sorrow, that is, without sin. There is no moral virtue without sin, is what he's saying. We are not masters of our actions from beginning to end, but servants. This is in opposition to the philosophers. What philosopher could he be talking about? We do not become righteous by doing righteous deeds, but having been made righteous... We do righteous deeds. This is an opposition to the philosophers. And he's even clearer in this next one. Virtually the entire Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle is the worst enemy of grace. He, I, I like how bold he is. You know what I mean? It's fun. It is an error to think that Aristotle's idea of you know my eudaimonia, right, human flourishing, does not contradict the doctrine of the universal church. It is an error to say that no man can become a theologian without Aristotle. Indeed, no one can become a theologian unless he becomes one without him. <laughs> and yet here is Lewis using Aristotle, right? So essentially, we, we can outline this, right? Aristotle's virtue ethics says to be virtuous is not just to do good, but to be good. We become virtuous through training and discipline. An early Protestant ethic says to be virtuous is not just to do good, but to be good. And we become virtuous through Jesus' righteousness, not our own. Okay. Go Here's for it. a quote from uh, John Gertzner. The main thing between you and God is not so much your sins, but your damnable good works. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm good works. Right? So, here's the question that, that I have. Lewis obviously thinks these two views are somewhat compatible. 
somewhat, right? Obviously, obviously Lewis believes this. And you read that in the last chapter, right? And yet he also believes that in some way, we do become virtuous through training and discipline. He uses that quote. He says that you become a better player, a good player of the game, through training the muscles, the eyes, right? So then the next question, how are these two compatible? In what way can we have both as a Christian? Because ultimately, Lewis has both, right? So how do you do both? Maybe, maybe you don't think you can, maybe you do, but talk about that in your groups for a little bit. Okay, does that question make sense? Yeah, say it okay. again. How can you have both of these? Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your salvation Well, yeah, Aristotle's the ver virtue ethic and the early Protestant slash Luther's ethics. Are they, how can you have both of them? Well, the thing I was going to do is that it's not. Well, there is a. I can be friends, but I'm just like saying the answer. Um, the, uh, I know, right? So, um, is it enough to just be like, okay, I trusted Jesus, I'm good, like, awesome. And then, how, but then how do you just go, don't I just reel myself and don't say, be good, be good work? What, where does, where, how do you reconcile those two? Like, because, like, if we were just like good to go after conversion, yeah. God would just like, we would get baptized and they hold us under. So, you know, like, finish this up because we're done. Like, we're already, you know, so why why continue living here? So, like, right. Right. Without having some training. So if you, there's really a balance. It's a balance. Well, the other thing is. Oh, yeah. One more minute, and then we'll come back. I like to think of it as, uh, we, I mean, the whole program for information is here, right? So what's the point? Why? Who cares? Like, we're going to go, right? So, um, I like to think of it as, um, like, with our kids, we, we 
love them all the same. And we're not satisfied with leaving them as the best way. They're a food the floor. As they became 16 years old, that would be a problem, right? We don't want them to grow into you know, better human beings. Feed. Feed. Yeah. So I guess one of the ways to look at it is that um, we come out and our righteousness is oh, right in the Holy Spirit in us, and we have to like unravel that. Come on back. Come on back. So, kind of like last time, I would like someone to summarize the answer to this question. How can you have both ethical views? What would it look like to have both? I think Philippians uh, 2, oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 2, 12 and 13, uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Gives both perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, this group came up with several good things. Um, one is is the idea of. Uh, kind of that ultimate objective. Where are we going with this? And, and Lewis kind of talks about this with the ship analogy. Mm -hmm. There's that third aspect of, is the ship getting to where it needs to go? Mm -hmm. And in, in the Aristotelian mind, it's just uh, self-elevation, uh, grandizing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas our, our goal is uh, to elevate Christ and not ourselves, and to put ourselves aside. Yeah. The other thing is that you know that training and, and discipline is not in the Aristotelian view. That's kind of a self-determined training and discipline. I'm going to do this. Whereas Sherry brought up the idea that it's the church. This is something that happens in the church that we do this training and discipline. We recognize this is not something we can accomplish in our own strength. This is why we need to be in church. Yeah. Not only because what we give to the church and what the church does for us, but it's the it's the accountability that we find in church that helps us to achieve the ability to have virtuous lives. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm grab this real quick. Is there room, for those of you that grab one of these, is there room to write some things on the back? Yeah. Okay. Yes. If you have pens, uh, I'll, I'll use it in a minute. I'm just trying to figure out where to go next. So, there's this quote that I think actually summarizes pretty well. How to, how to hold both, right? How to hold both. So the quote, the original quote, I'm going to change a little. The original quote, Lewis says that a good player is a person whose eyes and muscles and nerves have been so trained by making innumerable good shots that they can now be relied on, right? I, I reframe it a little bit because I think this is actually the clearest way to say what Lewis means. A virtuous person is a person whose eyes and muscles and nerves have been so trained by being rooted in Christ's righteousness that they can now be relied on. Been so trained not by pulling yourself up, but by being rooted in what Christ did for us that they can now be relied on. There's still discipline, there's still virtue. There's still growth. They're still becoming moral. But it's not on you. It's because of what Christ has done. And you rooting yourself in that is ultimately the means for that engine. Right? That it, if morals exist to some level so that the human machine can run well, well, what's the fuel of that machine? What's the thing that's propelling it forward? It's 
It's being rooted in Christ. And if we're not first rooted in Christ, then we don't stand a chance of being more. Right? So I want us to spend a minute and actually apply this for ourselves and, and have a tool that we can use to, to think through this. Right? Because ultimately, we want to be growing. Our church right now is doing more or less a theme this year of spiritual disciplines. Because we believe in discipline and exercise and growth in these areas, right? We, we want to have growth. So I want us to think about how do we apply this when we're doing these spiritual disciplines, whether it's prayer or reading scripture or what have you, right? Whatever that moral thing is. So first, for those of you that have pen and paper, um, Oh, well, I'll, I'll read this too. Spiritual disciplines root a person in the goodness of God so that the person can become a reliable representation of Christ. Right? They, they're rooted in God so that they can become reliable. They, they reflect Christ well. Right? Um, but here's what I want us to do. Just for a moment. If you have a pen and paper, great. Write this down. If not, just think about them. Uh, write down a few spiritual or moral virtues that make you feel proud when they're kept or irritated when they're broken, right? We all have that thing, whether it's trying to read scripture and I feel like I don't do it enough or, you know, whatever that thing is. Maybe it's talking to a neighbor. Maybe I feel like, oh, I should be evangelizing, right? That thing. What is that spiritual or moral virtue that makes you feel proud when it's kept and frustrated when it's broken? Go ahead and write one or two of those down real quick and, and try to figure out what those might be for you. keep them or frustrated I, I know I get frustrated when others don't keep my stuff and I've got my you know my virtues why don't you keep them so just write some of those down think about them for a minute okay so with that in mind First thing that I want us to do, okay, well, I'm going to give you three points, three steps, right? The first step here is ask yourself. Okay, the first step is ask yourself. And you ask yourself, why am I trying to do this? What personal problem am I trying to overcome by following that moral rule? Okay. Now, we don't have to go terribly deep if you don't want to, but in your groups, I would like you to discuss that a little bit and try to tease out. You know, here, here's the moral virtue or the thing that I hold up. And this is kind of what I see is why I'm after it, right? So again, in groups, what, what I'll have you do, if you're comfortable or if you want to, share what that moral virtue is and then why you think you pursue it. What problem do you think it's solving for you? Right, go ahead and do that for just a few minutes in groups. Or, or maybe, actually, let's do this. Rather than doing groups, if you're comfortable sharing just in front of everyone, we can just kind of popcorn through some of those things. That's good. Yeah, you don't have to do that again, right? But if you do feel comfortable. Say the assignment. Sure, so here's the question, here's the question. What is that thing, right? And why do you feel like you're pursuing it? What, what is it giving you, right? From, yeah, this, one, from this one, right? Yeah. Generosity. Oh. Work here. Generosity is something that uh, I, I try to pursue, and I think the, there's a tendency to be greedy in life mm. and uh, forget about sharing the mm -hmm. blessings of the Lord with other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good, yeah. What else? What's another example of something that, that you tend to pursue and you might you know, have a reason for doing? I value organization, and I think I do that because even though I know I, there's nothing I can control in life, at least I can try to manage some things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great example. Yeah, thanks. I was thinking that there are two sides to this. 
one side is a societal, and um, like in our community right now, theft is just out of control. And so it's not just the theft, but it's a disrespect for the belongings of others. And that, I think, is a societal issue, because I don't usually steal a lot of things. Um, no, usually. No, usually. usually. I mean, and the, the personal one is for me it's a, a lack of prayer time mm -hmm. in order to draw nearer to Christ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thanks for sharing let me, let me give a little bit of a, a kind of another way of getting at this right so we have these moral virtues these things that we hold on a pedestal right I should be doing this, or you should not be doing that, or I should not be doing that, right? Most of the time, I'm willing to bet that the why at the core of it, kind of that thing, is oftentimes to increase your virtue. The reason we pursue organization or pursue prayer or attending church or small groups or the list goes on and on and on is because if I do this, I'll be a better person. Right? I'll be stronger, I'll, what, you know, I can develop myself. And so I need, I need to be praying every day because I need to build up, right? I need to connect with God, X, Y, and Z. You can, you can hear that narrative, right? Most of the time, when we do these sorts of things, our gut tendency is to try to take it in for ourselves because I need to make myself strong, right? It's that Aristotelian worldview. I need to exercise to become righteous. So the first thing you do is ask yourself, why do I feel compelled to do this? Okay, ask yourself. And then the second thing you do is tell yourself. And you tell yourself that Christ died for that too. <coughs> so the first thing, you know, I personally feel like, you know, prayer is an, an uh, easy example for me. You know, where I don't feel like I pray enough. I feel like I should be praying more. Why do I feel like I should be praying more? Well, because that's what I should be doing. It makes me better. Right? Me, 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 me. How can I pull myself up and just do it more? Right? Remind yourself that Christ died for that too. He died for the fact that I don't pray enough. He died that I can't pull myself up. Right? That I can't earn this sort of thing. Whatever it is, that I can't organize enough, that I can't... The list goes on and on. He died for that too. And so really, it's, it's sort of this question, how does being counted righteous by Jesus' death address the problem that we're trying to overcome? Right? So there's this problem that I'm trying to overcome. I'm not connected with God, or I don't give enough. Right? And how does Jesus' death get at those problems? Okay. Does that question make sense? How does Jesus' death get at that? So if someone feels comfortable kind of expanding on that, so, you know, what is the thing? Why do you do it? And how does Jesus' death actually solve for that? Mm. Can you tell me more about that? Oh. It helps us be content with slow growth, um, that we don't have to be... Like, it frees us to rest in Christ's completion while we're growing yeah. to become more mature. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with us wanting to be more spiritually mature, yeah. grow to be more like Christ, but to still rest in his provision and completion. Yeah. Yeah, no, it does. It does. It's rooted in that, right? We... We don't pursue these things so that we can be stronger on the basis of our own work, right? We pursue these things because we're rooted in Christ. And ultimately, when we pursue these things, right, it, it produces the proper fruit of, of a flourishing human, you know. And so the final thing, the third thing that you do, first is ask yourself, why am I doing this? The second is tell yourself that Christ died for that too, right, that his righteousness actually counts for that. So I don't need to pull myself up and earn it, right? And then the third thing that you do is you don't quit. 
Just because Christ died for that too, doesn't mean that we don't need to pray. It doesn't mean that we don't continue the disciplines, right? You actually return yourself to the task. So ask yourself, tell yourself, and return yourself to the task, right? We do good works as a response to God's good work. What he has done changes everything. And it gives us the freedom to try and discipline, to, to do these spiritual disciplines without needing to find our righteousness in them, right? We don't earn anything on our own merit through these disciplines. And yet we do them in order to continue to trade up because we are rooted in Christ, right? And ultimately we're, we're leading ourselves to reflect that. So to glorify God and not to earn our righteousness, that, that's ultimately the end. Yeah, go ahead. I think maybe this goes back to the previous slide, but if I recognize that I'm not being successful, I'm not um, being virtuous in every situation, yeah. that can compile, compound and I can really be down on myself and to the point that I'm not making any progress, but if I realize that Christ has given me a righteousness in God's eyes, mm -hmm. then I have hope. And as Lewis said later in this book, I can live with more joy, happiness, and be a better Christian yeah. in that perspective. Yeah. Whew. That's good stuff. I love that. For me, the uh, contrast between uh, Martha and the eldest son is helpful because uh, in the conflict between Mary and Martha, I'm a, I vote for Martha. Uh, you know, even though Jesus commanded Mary, uh, I really identify with Martha. And uh, she, Jesus still loved her, and she was still engaged with him. You know, when when uh, Lazarus died, she was the first to meet him, and she had you know this really good intimate encounter with Jesus, whereas the uh, eldest son, he wouldn't go into the party. He, 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 he separated himself from the Father. Yeah. And that's the challenge for me, is, is to, to recognize my tendency to be performance-oriented like, like Martha, but still go to the party. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. part for me is to submit. So all of this, as we talk about it, it's I, 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 I. It isn't I. It's God. It's done. He told us that on the cross. Our journey is part of that. It's already done. And so, you know, so my biggest Deal every single day is to shut up before I speak mm. and let him guide me. Yeah. Hardest thing is no more I. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Even when um, Craig was reading this last night, getting ready for today, I was compelled at the thoughts about. Um, our country was founded on a lot of the Greek philosophy and that to pull yourself up by your bootstraps is an American idea and individualism is an American idea. It's so seeped in our culture in every aspect of our thinking as a culture are these American ideas. Make my life a lot easier, but then I won't get my steps in. So this is how it <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just so it's you know, you're right in 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 
and thinking about you know these moral virtues and why we're striving to achieve them, and it's about me. But then we come right back here. We do good works, mm-hmm. and uh, I think we need to kind of keep that full perspective on mm-hmm. both sides of the coin. Mm-hmm. Paul says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Mm-hmm. So we can't we can't pat ourselves on the back, trading our, you know, thinking, well, we trade in for the right, a better end goal to all this, but we are still the ones doing the good work. And we've got to realize that we fall on that. Mm-hmm. And we really need to rely on God to help us do yeah. the good works. We do. It's not me. And I, I can round it out just by going back, because I think this idea really is at, at bottom, right? This is the core. And when we keep reading Lewis, the rest of this you know, book on Christian behavior, he's on Christian behavior, right? And so we can't lie to ourselves and think that what Lewis is saying is pull yourself up, right? That's not what he's saying. What he's really ultimately getting at is this idea that a virtuous person is a person whose eyes and muscles and nerves have been so trained by being rooted in Christ. It's God who wills and works, who, who causes us to will and work for his glory, right? So it's being rooted in Christ's righteousness and what God has done for us such that that person can now be relied on. So we can wrap up today just with this, that... We are called to do good works, and Lewis is going to continue to lead us in that, right? For the next couple of chapters, we're going to see various different ways that we can practice those good works. It's vital, though, to remember why and on what foundation are we doing good works, right? Because if we're not careful, we can lose it, we can get lost in the weeds, and remember that we do these things because of what Christ has done for us. So, I love that Noah Hour is right up against the Sunday morning service because we get to go worship the God who has made it possible for us to be virtuous. Amen? So, um, we can pray, and then we can wrap it all up. Heavenly Father, you are the magnificent, glorious, and virtuous God. You are the foundation of virtue. You are the center and the core of all of morality. You are good. Father, we know that on our own strength, we fall short. So thank you for sending your Son to be our righteousness. Thank you, Father, for that. We pray that we would be rooted in that, that we would be trained in that, disciplined in that, to spend time in your word, to to commune with you through prayer and and church community. God, we're grateful for the tools that you've given us. Help us to lean into that because of the work that you have done for us. And God, we pray that when we're engaging with our neighbors, when we're trying to, you know, communicate about ethics or, or morals or we're trying to talk to people that might have a different view than us, God, I pray that we would not be so obsessed with the checklist trying to make sure that everyone fits the box perfect, right? But God, I pray that we would be more interested in the heart, that we would be more interested in seeing people who are rooted in Christ rather than fill out the checkbox of ethics. God, we we are grateful again for your work, and and we're excited to go and worship you today. So Lord, we, we do pray for our service. We pray for... James as he preaches, that he would preach the word, that we would be able to receive that. And God, we pray that you would lead us to into worship this morning. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, Tyler. Cool. Quick, couple quick things, guys. Um, first of all, I, yeah, I, I really do appreciate that. I think I have, in the past, been very, like, works driven and I'll, I'll tell you what it's very it's exhausting and you you don't see any fruit from it um there's a great quote i don't remember who it was but it talked about how because one of the things that really has helped me and changed me 
is slowing down, like taking the time to be silent and Sabbath. But those things, um, they don't so much restore you as they restore you. Make sense? Restory you. And that's what I need is to be restoried. And that helps me to, to grow. And I think back to the spiritual disciplines thing, church is one of those. It's the community part of it. It's not like, okay, because you went to church, you know, because you went to church every week this year, you're going to make, you get a free ticket to heaven. No, it's, it's that um, this, is, this helps us to, to grow our characters. Once again, one of the things I said in our group too is, our, our, the righteousness in God is, is latent in the Holy Spirit in us. And so we just need to like let that open up. Um, one quick thing, just some, um, what do you call it? Like logistical things? Uh, housekeeping, thank you, yeah. So somebody asked, uh, hey, I want to be able to um, pull an all-nighter and write this essay at the last second, right, Dwayne? Um, so let's, let's put a due date on it. April 3rd, I would love you guys to have your papers in because then I can get it back to you guys because our last no hours on, on Palm Sunday. So once again, this is not because I am some mean guy or because Paul thinks I'm going to go and throw your essay in, at my professors and get a grade off that. No, the, the purpose of this is because if we can write clearly, that shows that we think clearly. And the goal here with the knowing no hour is to to know what we're thinking, to know and be able to explain our faith. And so if we can't write it down well, it means we don't think well, we need to work on our thinking. So it's once again, it's an exercise, it's good for me. I'm sure it would be good for all you guys too. So don't think of it as some mean, mean thing. But yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. Okay, good. What is, in your mind, mere Christianity? What is the essence, the crux, if you will, of the crux? What What is the the meat and potatoes of Christianity? Okay. Uh, I want a 20-page dissertation <laughs> with you know. footnotes, to at least 10 sources, primary documents preferably. No, it, seriously, if you write a one-pager, cool. Hey, if you think, if you can get it all on one page, great. Don't Seriously, no pressure. Just do something because it helps you think. So, yes, Dwayne. I think uh, for me it's useful to think of uh, that I, my mere Christianity is a little bit, encompasses a little bit more than C.S. Lewis's. I'm not happy with his... He was and that's fine. Yeah. I'm not happy with his view of the atones. Okay. You know, so that's that's where it's useful to me. Yep. So there you go. So it just it's really to help you think more clearly about what is the the important things, because we can get caught up in all these little tertiary arguments of the differences in nominations or whether you should get vaccinated or have masks or all this whatever craziness, right? Politics. Uh, what is the mere Christianity? Okay, what, what do we need to bring to the world rather than argue about all these petty things? That's, that's, the, that's the assignment. Does that answer yep. the question? Cool. All right, cool. Anything else? Anybody? All right, cool. You guys are dismissed. Have a great fellowship today.